Good morning and welcome to Keystone Church Online. My name is Lauren Foster. This is my beautiful wife, Lauren, and we pastor here at Keystone Church. And we just wanted to take a minute to let you know what you can expect here with Church Online, if, especially if this is your first time joining us. The heart of our church is to make every person feel welcome. And so part of what you'll see this morning is a glimpse into our home because we want you to feel like you've been welcomed home into our church family. And if you're encouraged or you're a part of our church family already and you'd like to give towards supporting the vision as we advance the gospel in our community and beyond, on our website, keystonechurchpa.com, there's some different options in which you can give and support the ministry. We're so glad that you're here today and hope this message encourages you with the hope of Jesus. Example, what Paul is writing here 
of a life that's fully surrendered. Like, Lord, whatever you have for my life, I am ready. In fact, I know it's going to be hard. I know what's ahead of me isn't going to be easy, but I'm up to the task. Acts 20, 35. And here's what he says before he leaves this particular group of people. And I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That phrase is so critical. We're going to look in Scripture to even see when Jesus talks about this kind of paradigm. And by the way, this is a, a whole life kind of a giving. This isn't just segmented to, to, to resources or finances. This is like, Lord, my time, my treasure, my talent, all of my life. It's better, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So here's the big question that I want us to answer this morning. How did Jesus serve us, and how do we, in turn, learn to serve like him? What serving even look like? What does it even mean? And, and I just want you to know, we have a lot of people here that we have a serve team at this church. Uh, since day one, there have been people that have been serving and sacrificing in a bunch of different areas. And in fact, last Saturday, we had upwards of 50, 60 people that came out to serve at our new facility. It was amazing to see how much just, just God was bringing so many people together, so much activity taking place. In fact, you, you see it every weekend behind the scenes. Even where we've been at the RLA, we've had people here setting up, tearing down, serving in kids' ministry. Can we just put our hands together and thank those that have been serving and sacrificing? So here are the two ways you're going to want to, to really hear this message this weekend. For some, if you bought into this idea that, hey, the Lord desires that I would serve, that I'd be a servant leader in my life in some form or fashion. For some of you, you might have a tendency to say, well, I've already got this foster. I'm going to just check the box, tune out. There's not a whole lot that I can learn from this. Well, even if you said, man, I'm invested, I am serving in some capacity in my walk with the Lord, I want you to be reminded of the purpose behind your serving. And then secondly, for, for some that maybe you haven't stepped into this paradigm of serving yet, you're new to the church, or maybe life is busy, or the seasons in your life have changed, or maybe you don't even really buy into the whole idea that that's the way Jesus would desire that we would all live. I want you to start to see that a servant-minded lifestyle is not an obligation, but it's actually a response to how Jesus has lived, loved, and served our lives. In fact, I would say it like this. Serving is not something that Jesus did. It's who he is. It's in the very essence and nature of of who Christ is. And make no mistake, if you never dis if you never develop a serving mentality in your life, this never grows for you, then there's going to be times in your life spiritually where you're going to be you're going to be limited in your growth. And I'm going to prove it to you in scripture. Because when you follow Jesus, you're not simply consuming from his kingdom, but you're contributing to it as well. There are things that all of us as believers, we gain from the body of Christ. But we gain from being together in fellowship when it comes to being a part of a local church and walking with Christ. But there is also the Lord saying, hey, I want every part of your life to be fully surrendered to me. And there are two ditches. The first ditch that you can fall into is the one where it's an extreme, where we, we see the needs of those around us. And we see that there, there are areas where, Lord, I could help make a difference. But we decide, cross our arms, say, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take that step. I'm not going to make that move. Essentially, what that would look like is us moving into a brand new building so that that building can actually just be a conduit to be a blessing to the community at large. But for all of us to just get in and say, well, we're in a new space and we're done. We're comfortable. We're where we're supposed to be. Instead of realizing that this new space we're about to walk into in a few weeks, it's really a launching pad for what the Lord wants to do next. It's an opportunity for us to say, hey, we had five seats at the table right now. Now we get to extend the table a little bit more and invite more people in that don't know the Lord, that don't have a church family. You're going to be invited to gather around the table as well. We're setting a place for you. We're ready to welcome you. We're ready to serve the needs of our community. We're ready to lift up our eyes and see a purpose that's greater than ourselves. The second ditch that we could fall into is those that, man, you wholeheartedly, you love serving and sacrificing for the Lord, but what can tend to happen is you can start to feel like, man, well, all the things that I do for God and all my efforts, uh, you know, Lord, I'm doing so much for you, don't I get something in return? 
it's like your, your intentions, your, your heart may start to drift towards, you know what, I, I need something on the other end of this. It's like, have you ever received a gift around Christmas time's coming up here very soon? Maybe around a birthday, you ever receive a gift from someone where it just felt like there was a little bit of a string attached? It was like, I know I'm getting a gift, but there's something else on the other side of this. Like, I just don't know if the intentions are totally pure with what's going on. A few years ago, Lauren and I we went on vacation. We were staying at this place, and right when we checked in, man, they had a sales presentation ready. It's like, you're, you're waiting. And uh, a guy sits down and he wants to present us with an option where he says, hey, uh, we want to we provide you a free romantic dinner while you're here and you're staying on vacation for the next few days. I'm like, this sounds incredible, free dinner. You know, they're like, well, you know, it, it's free, but you have to sit through a presentation. And I'm like, a presentation? And I, and I know, I've, I've, I've played the game. Maybe I've played the timeshare game before when you've gone out. Okay, so I, I'm, I, I am prepared, like I am ready, I am protected, the walls are up, and it's, it's just a 45-minute presentation. What breakfast is provided, I'm like, it, it, and they had me at free food. I'm like, okay, free food, I, I'm going to sit through this. So the next day we go down, and, and it's, it's a morning meeting or whatever, and the guy's waiting for us, Mr. and Mrs. Foster, come over here, and if, Coffee? You want croissant? You want, what do you want? What do you need? And, 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 and it's a beautiful spread on the table, and, and they start to give you all the reasons why you need to vacation, and it's always this outrageous amount. Like, you know, and, and you start to think as you're listening to these people, and they're brilliant salespeople, like you, you're thinking to yourself, I know this costs as much as a house, but it just makes sense. I mean, you know, just a few, you know, decade worth of payments, and we can do this. And so, of course, it's no, no. I've had to say no like 17 times to get through this meeting. And then at the end, it was like when we finally said no, and we got up to leave, you could see the demeanor of the gentleman that was selling us this whole pack, trying to sell us this package. Everything changed. It was like, you are dead to me. You know, get, I'm, I'm walking away. And you could tell, man, his intentions really weren't as pure as he initially described. It's exactly what happened to James and John when they were following Jesus. They thought as they served Christ, they deserved something on the other end of the life that they were living. I want us to see it in Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 45. This is Jesus teaching about how to serve others. Verse 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to Talking about Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. Uh, what's your request? He asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, <laughs> this is so bold, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering? I must be baptized with Look what they said in the very next verse. Oh, yes, they replied. We're able. They have no idea what they're signing up for. They have no idea what they're asking Jesus. And, and, and it goes on to say, uh, then Jesus told them, oh, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. Jesus knew that these guys are going to have to suffer. They don't realize exactly what they're asking for, but it's coming. But I have no right to say, who will sit on my right or left? God has prepared those places for the ones he's chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Verse 43. But among you it will be different. So right here, Jesus saying, I'm about to give you a blueprint for the way you're supposed to aim to serve in your life when it comes to following me. It's going to be different from the paradigm of the world. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to first wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
This is so powerful because the world would tell us that you need to be the man, the woman in charge. It's about authority. It's about control. It's about power. It's about position. And Jesus is saying, no, if you're following me and if you're actually living your life according to a kingdom paradigm, it's going to be completely different. If you want to be a leader, you must first be a servant. And serving others is simply responding to the way that Jesus has already served us. There are a lot of talented individuals that never accomplish the purposes and the plans that God, that God has laid out for their lives because the position of their heart hasn't been in the right place. I would say it like this. God's not looking for the most talented individual that could, that could use their talents for the kingdom. He's looking for the person that's most willing to say, Lord, I'm going to be fully surrendered to you. My life is yours. Whatever I have in my hand, my, ta my time, my talent, my treasure, it's yours to begin with. Anyways, And if you'll give him your heart, he'll empower you to accomplish his purpose through what he's blessed you with. And serving is not about building our profile or making our star shine or, 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 or getting likes on social media. It's about building the kingdom of God. It's this. Jesus modeled servant leadership. That was the essence of who Jesus was, how he lived his life. And let's look at what happened with James and John. Back in verse 35, when they ask, what's your request? Uh, when you sit in your glorious throne, I want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. Uh, they're saying, Lord, what's in it for me? I, I want the bonus package. I want the perks. I want something because I've been serving you. And they, they really, they wanted to honor Jesus, but they also wanted to make sure they were honored themselves. They wanted to make sure they got recognition for the way they had been living and walking with Jesus. And again, Jesus goes on to say, you don't know what you're asking. You're, you're going to drink from this cup. It's, it's coming. The suffering that I'm going to endure, you will as well. And the reality was, as James and John, they're devising this plan for their own honor. You know, I've suffered with Jesus for a little bit. Where's my recognition? Where's my crown? This is the exact place at times in our lives where we can actually start to blend our worship of Jesus with our own self-interest. We can start to see what we're, we're asking really is, you know, what, what, what's in it? What's in it for me? I mean, I can see at times it's a, uh, I joke around with my kids because whenever they do great things, you know, around the house, we want to encourage them and we want to make sure that they know these are, these are good things that we want to support and celebrate. But there are times where, where both my kids over the years at, at different moments, like they've done something good and it's like, They've even done the, they, they've even done like the, the money, like they, they don't even say anything to me. Like, yeah, I, 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 I cleaned up the dishes in the kitchen. I'm like, what is this? It's like, what, what, what do you mean, what is this? I did, I cleaned up. They're like, you cleaned up, which means you get to live here another day. Like, you, the heat's on for a reason. You know, and this is just part of being, this is we're in a family. But I love that, you know, of course, we want to encourage things that are good, but how often can it be that we see something that, that we're doing for the Lord? It's like, there are times I'm like, oh, but God, you, you own me for the way that I'm living my life. And Jesus is saying, listen, that paradigm is, is, is the opposite of someone that follows Jesus. If you're going to be a servant-minded leader, you should see the way that you live your life is different from everybody else. We're, we're not building our lives. The kingdom is not built on power or authority. It's the way that Jesus lived. Here's how Jesus instructs us in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I want you to read that scripture on the screen for just a moment. So I want to just tell you, personally, I remember hearing this scripture as a teenager years ago, and I've heard it misused many times. So this, I've always heard this reference oftentimes reference in regards to a financial gift. So essentially, if you give God a dollar, uh, he's going to press that dollar down, he's going to shake it together, it's going to be running over, and then more money is going to be poured into your lap. It's like, if I give God a dollar, he's going to give me a gift. It's almost like a spiritual lottery ticket, okay? I want you to know that is not what this scripture is referencing whatsoever. This is not a prosperity gospel piece of, uh, of scripture, scriptural truth. What this is referring to, this is an illustration for the way grain needs to be measured. And so what would happen is a good measure of grain would be poured into a container. 
And when that grain was poured into a container, the, the essence was the more grain that you could fit into the container, the better for the person that was wanting the grain to be filled in that container in the first place. So what they would do is they fill the grain in the container in order to make more room. They would press it down. They would shake it together. And then they'd be able to fit more grain into the container. To the point that after you were able to, to press and shake, you did that over and over and over again, the, the hope was it would almost be so full that it would be spilling over, and that would be looked at as, as a very full container of grain that would be better for the person that was receiving it. And so when Jesus says, for the measure you use, it will be measured to you, here's what Christ is saying. When you give to me in the natural, your time, talent, treasure, when you give to me of your life, that natural giving of your life, I'm actually going to return that in a supernatural way. So you think what you are investing is good, and it is, but it's not a one-for-one one return. It's not I'm giving God 10 ounces, and he's going to give me 10 ounces in return. It's like, no, I'm going to give God what I have in the natural, and he's going to actually do something that's way more supernatural in my life that's going to keep filling my life to the place where one day it can be overflowing. And I think I'm so encouraged by that because how many of you know if, if you follow Jesus for any length of time, how many of you, you would agree with this statement? What God has given to you in your life has been far greater than anything you could have ever given to him. How many of you agree with that statement? That's the way the Lord works. It's like, man, I, I am I'm doing my best to give God my life, but what God has given me in return, what God's done in my life in return, what God's done in your life in return, it's so much bigger, it's so much more than we could ever give in our own effort and our own ability. It's, it's, it's such a great exchange. And when you're living this generous life, it's like you're saying, God, every part of me, I am willing to give to you. I, I want this impact to be this supernatural transaction. It's a life that's spilling over with God's supernatural goodness. And I'll be honest with you, when you're around people that have that kind of a paradigm in their life, that they're just generous in all areas of, of their life, they just have a bigger outlook on life. People that are that are that, that are that are that have a generous mindset with the way they live, they have more optimism. It seems like they have more faith. It seems like they, they trust God for what's next and what can be done. They just see things differently. Man, it stretches my faith when I'm around somebody that lives their life in that way. I'm like, man, I want to I serve God like that. I want to believe God for things like that. That is someone that's emptied their life of themselves, and they say, God, whatever I have, I want to give to you. I want you to press it down. I want you to shake it together. I want more of you in my life. Fill this container. Let it spill over so that my life can be used for your glory. Let whatever I have, God, let it be in exchange for what you have to give to me. And so this, this kind of life, it's like at the end of your life, and you're, you're, if, if they're talking about the way you've lived at your funeral, I've never been to a funeral where they've eulogized somebody and they've talked about the way they've lived and they said, you know what, uh, John, he lived a very stingy, shallow life. And the people around him, they were so inspired by the way he was selfish and small-minded, and, uh, and he never made a difference beyond himself, but man, we're, we're, we're so grateful for the, the, the impact that he had. It's like, that's not the way you want to be remembered. Why? Because that's not the way you were designed to live. God's saying, as, as, as you give of your life, it's going to be returned back to you, but it's going to be returned back to you in such a unique, supernatural way. Because what is in our hands and what's in our life is actually, it's only with us temporarily. It's not going to remain with you forever. I talk about this even as, as we get ready to step in this new building. I, this is just, the baton is being passed to our church, graciously by God. We're not the first church that's been in that building. We may not be the last. It, maybe God gives us an opportunity one day that we can do what this church has done for us. I don't know what the future holds for this space. But I know that while it's in our hands, we have a responsibility to honor it while God's giving it. When I was in high school, I, I was, I, I don't know if I'd be fast compared to today's standards, but back then, a long time ago, I was, I was fast. I ran on our four-by-one team and, and, and ran track in high school, and in the year that, that I ran, the four-by-one, the first year, I remember our track coach, he talked to me about the importance of making sure 
so that you never drop the baton. If you've ever seen this race, everybody, four guys run a leg of 100 meters, and when they're running, and before you can start running your leg of the race, the baton has to be passed, has to be grabbed by the next runner, and there's a, there's a unique handoff that takes place, and then you, you've got to go. Now, if, if you ever dropped the baton during the race, that was the worst possible thing that you could do. Not only because you would have gotten chewed out by our coach, but because in all likelihood, you, you're losing that race. You can't make up for the time that's lost when the baton's dropped. It's, it's just too much to take the place. So the reality is, he would, all, he would just drill this into our heads, that you've got to remember what's in your hands. Hold on to the baton. Don't drop it. So when you look at your life and what God's given you, it's like the Lord, it, with as much grace and love and mercy, is trying to communicate to all of us, hey, it's in your hand right now, but don't drop it. But it's only going to be in your hand for a season before you have to hand it off. Because while we're here, we only have a limited amount of time to give of whatever the Lord has entrusted us with. And serving it's sacredly spiritual, it's modeling what Jesus taught. It's, it's the, the word in the, in the Hebrew is diakonos. It, it, it means deacon. And it's, it's really someone that has the mindset of being a servant leader. It means there's no need too small or insignificant that can be met. It's not about making ourselves famous in this city or Keystone Church's name, but it's about Jesus being made greater, and his name being made more famous. Because when we're serving with the right heart, nobody needs to know. We don't have to receive the recognition or the, or, or the glory, I think. Part of the reason why uh, so many things happen tragically in ministry is because we're not designed to receive that kind of glory for our lives. You're not designed to be worshipped. You, you are created to be a worshiper, but only one, and that's the Lord Jesus, is to be worshipped. So when, when somebody tries to receive worship, it, it never it never lasts. It can, it can only end in disaster. Why? Because we're not created to receive that kind of glory. Only God is. I want to just say three things about what we need to remember when it comes to our servant leadership. I hope this encourages you. And then we'll close here. It's a servant leader, number one. Put service over status. Verse 43, when Jesus spoke, he said, But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And I'm just telling you, what I, what I can sense in my heart and in my spirit is the Lord is gracious our church in a time and a place where we're going to be able to serve and reach people in our community like we never have been before. In fact, I'm going to let you know we're, we're, we're having Vision Sunday next weekend. And if you, if, if this is your church home, if this is where you have, you have you're rooted, you are grounded, please do not miss next weekend. Uh, because I want to share even further what I sense God, His desire is we step into this new space. I want to give you updates and details about all that's happening and taking place. But I really believe that God has some significant spiritual steps for our church to take as we head into a brand new season and a brand new direction. And I, I, I want to tell you right now, but I'm going to wait. I'm like, it's, it's God bless you. I, I want to say it so bad, but I'm going to wait until next Sunday. But I'm just telling you, uh, I, I just, I, I can sense in my heart what God wants to do. And we have to remember that to a servant puts character over comfort. Whoever wants to first wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. The word there is doulos. It means a bond servant. It means someone in a, in a, in a socioeconomic context. It meant that this person was bound to the owner uh, in, in really a repayment of a debt that was being that was being paid. And it's really our lives saying, Jesus, I, I am bound to you. Um, I, I am so grateful for the debt that you have paid. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to be bound to you. I'm going to be fully surrendered to
to you is this rhythm and pattern of living. Service means self-denial, putting down our preference, our convenience. It's saying, Lord, I'm going to make a commitment to serving others, meeting people's needs. And this type of character and serving and sacrifice can bring so much joy. Listen to what John Stott said. To the very first thing which needs to be said about Christian ministers of all kinds is that they're under people as their servants rather than over them as their leaders, let alone their Lord. Jesus made this absolutely plain. The chief characteristic of Christian leaders, he insisted, is humility, not authority, and gentleness, not power. We want to be a people to serve and not look to our own comfort, but look to the needs of others. It's Jesus saying, I've got a better way for you to live. Here's what I want to challenge parents in this room, families, if you're raising Maybe, maybe you're not at this stage, and, but one day you will be. I, I want you to know that the way you live your life right now, if your kids are watching, and they're observing, and they're taking notes, and if you want to cultivate this kind of, this paradigm, this kind of rhythm in your family, then mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, you, you lead the way with how you serve and how you pour out your life. Because your kids are following your lead. They're following your example. You know, believe it or not, even as a pastor, I, I didn't grow up in church. I, I surrendered my life to Christ when I was a teenager. And so I didn't have an example in my home. But I can tell you that I watched people in my life that made a profound impact. Like the way they lived, it was just different. It inspired me. It encouraged me. I wanted more of what they had. And I started to just, I was just around church. I mean, every time the doors of church were open, I was there. And I was just trying to figure out how can I help, what can I do? And what started to happen, and I didn't realize this at, at first, but it was like, man, I've got a purpose here. And I, I, I can make a difference here. But I, I, I can sense that, that there are people that want to invest their life into my life here spiritually. And I noticed that I was starting to grow just one little step at a time. And there was a process that was taking place, and friendships were starting to form. And then it started to become something like, and this isn't just something that I do. I'm not obligated to do it. I just I just want to be here. I want to be in the house of God. I want to be around God's people. I want to grow in this way. And, and, and families in this room, when your kids see that, they, they, they start to form an identity like, this is just this is just part of our life. This is just who we, who we are. And of course, there are times where, you know, it's like, man, I'll I don't, want to, I don't want to go on Sunday. I'm tired. There's things that are happening. I, mean, I get it. Life is busy. It's crazy. But what we're trying to instill in our family is that this is just this is just something we do. We go to church. We serve. We're going to do what God desires us to do. If I wasn't pastoring and I didn't, I wasn't preaching a message. I promise you, I would be serving. I'd be doing whatever God asked me to do in the context of a local church because I see it in God's word. I know that's God's design, and I know it's just it's a better way to live. The servant lives the life of selfless surrender. Scripture says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. I mentioned when we get to the end of our life that the people, they're not going to remember all of the things that you achieved, all of your accolades, all of the awards you won, whatever you did individually, they're going to remember what you did for them relationally, where you served, where you showed up, where you were there in a moment of need. And they're going to talk about the sacrifices that you made on their behalf. I had a really good friend of mine who came in last week. He's got some amazing footage of the church. He's a drone pilot, so he, he flies drones for the people that were serving at the church. I laughed because there were drones flying all around the building, and people are looking up like, what is happening? Is Amazon about to drop a package? Is, is this, you know, what, what's going on? And he caught some amazing footage you're going to see in the future of the new space, but his dad passed away a few years ago. And if you knew Chuck, he was a man. Chuck was one of the most servant-minded individuals I've ever met in my life. Everywhere he went, people knew this man and his character. Generous, 
pressing down, shaking together, running over, kind of a light. Lord, like, and God is just using this guy in very simple but profound ways. And I remember after he passed, it, it was very tragic the way it happened. His funeral was packed. People standing outside of the building and they couldn't get in. But there were so many people that showed, that showed up to give honor and, and to remember and recognize the life he lived. And I remember asking my friend Matt, I'm like, Matt, what's going through your mind, man? Like, I know you're missing your dad, and I know that your dad lived in such a, just an amazing, such an example for you, for your brother, for your family. Like, what's going through your mind right now? And I wrote this down. He said, my dad did such a great job serving, but I want to carry his legacy and do even more for the sake of him. So I want you to think about, I know some of you, you don't know Chuck, but the life he lived, it left an imprint on those around him, those that showed up to honor his life at his funeral. But I want you to think of the impact he made to his own family, to his sons, to his grandchildren, to those that are going to now carry the baton that's in their hands for what God wants to do through their life. You have no idea who may thank you in heaven for the way that you serve and Because serving makes an impact.